today uh, I'll tell you uh, about uh, some of the developments, uh, mostly theoretical developments in trying to uh, study quantum uh, many body systems out of equilibrium. And uh, the work I am presenting today has been done uh, in collaboration with uh, several people. Uh, particular, most of the work uh, was uh, that you'll see uh, towards uh, the second half of the lecture was done uh, by Tao Shi uh, from the Max Planck Institute. Uh, it also uh, sort of really something motivated by uh, the work uh, uh, which was uh, done primarily by Mertaj Babadi, uh, who was at Harvard and then moved to Broad Institute, and also by Dima Banin, who was also uh, at Harvard and then, uh, is now in Geneva, and who will also be a lecturer in the school. And uh, uh, some earlier closely related work has been done in collaboration uh, with Alexei and Yulia. And uh, unfortunately, I'll not uh, have time to talk about this, but I'll be uh, happy to. Uh, sort of tell you uh, between the lectures. Okay, so uh, let me start uh, in a way of introduction by contrasting, uh, well not by contrasting, but just uh, sort of giving you my own perspective on a state of condensed matter systems or condensed matter physics. So traditional condensed matter uh, physics addresses uh, the, addresses questions of equilibrium and uh, phase diagrams. And uh, many body phases can be uh, very different. So this, uh, we can talk about states of broken symmetry. Say this is a rich phase diagram of high temperature superconductors. So there is an antiferromagnetic state where the spin symmetry is broken. There is a superconducting state where uh, the U1 symmetry of charge conservation is broken. We can talk about the Fermi liquid uh, state uh, or this exotic non-Fermi liquid behavior. There may be uh, something which is uh, kind of even uh, more surprising, such as topological states as realized in the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, and uh, even systems which are sort of done artificially, if we just want very specific types of uh, many body behavior. So in this case, if we want to get a P wave superconductor, which is not easily accessible in nature, we can think of designing uh, uh, heterostructures which involved, say, semiconductors with spin orbit coupling, uh, uh, proximity couple to superconductors. But in all of these cases, uh, uh, we're usually interested in uh, uh, systems which are very uh, strongly coupled to the environment. So they're very uh, uh, to some kind of heat bath, usually uh, due to phonons. So they are in thermal equilibrium. And then when we talk about dynamics, we talk about linear response theory. So uh, all of the conventional uh, kind of experiments, uh, uh, such as neutron and X-ray scattering, uh, optical uh, conductivity, or STM, they all measure a very similar type of uh, time-dependent correlation functions, the so-called retarded uh, correlation functions, which contain information about the excitation spectrum. So just to remind you, uh, let's say when we talk about STM, uh, we measure what's called the spectral function uh, of electrons, the local density of states, which is just imaginary part uh, of the single particle Green's function. Uh, if we talk about neutron or X-ray scattering, this measures, uh, uh, let's say in the case of X-ray, this would be density density response uh, function. Uh, and uh, this is kind of what you traditionally find in textbooks. Uh, however, in the last uh, uh, kind of few years, I think the emphasis uh, of uh, what is at the forefront of condensed metaphysics has been changing. And uh, this is uh, driven uh, by experiments. Uh, and just to mention uh, this kind of like some of the uh, uh, exciting experiments uh, that uh, pe people do in these days. Uh, uh, there are new probes of many body systems. Uh, for example, the so-called uh, resonant uh, X-ray scattering. So I'll say uh, uh, more about this probe uh, later on, but it really involves, uh, involves like an X-ray exciting an electron from one of the core orbitals into the conduction band so that we uh, resonantly couple to interesting many body excitations uh, of electrons in the conduction band. Then there are pump and probe experiments when you uh, uh, send the first uh, uh, light pulse in order to uh, sort of drive the system into an interesting uh, 
uh, state. Uh, I'll give you an example uh, of auto-induced superconductivity when the first pulse induces a state uh, which uh, uh, has a superconducting uh, uh, correlations, uh, and then uh, the second pulse uh, is used to probe uh, the stringent state. Then uh, we also have uh, systems in which uh, solid state systems, which in uh, many respects are atom-like, so they are still coupled to the environment but weakly, and therefore one can apply sufficiently strong driving to uh, basically uh, justify treating them uh, as uh, sort of isolated systems and so one can realize exotic driven states. Uh, uh, so we can, uh, this has been used for example to create uh, things uh, like time crystals and hopefully we'll hear more about uh, this from Dima Abanin. And uh, then uh, there is a whole field of ultra cold atoms, so synthetic matter, uh, which are systems uh, that are sufficiently well isolated from the environment that uh, there is basically no bath, and therefore we really have to understand uh, evolution uh, of uh, of closed uh, quantum systems. And of course, uh, uh, what you remember from your textbooks, uh, usually uh, the assumption is, oh, unless uh, you have some special uh, kind of integrability, then if the system uh, is uh, sort of chaotic, then uh, it very uh, it equilibrate towards uh, uh, some kind of real uh, thermal thermal like state, forgetting about its initial condition. But that actually turns out to be not such an obvious assumption and needs to be re-examined uh, in many important cases. Okay, so uh, this is uh, a cloud line of uh, the lectures. Uh, so uh, first, I'll try to motivate uh, the. Uh, uh, kind of why we really uh, want to develop new uh, theoretical tools, right? I already briefly mentioned, you know, this uh, richness of uh, new condensed matter type uh, experiments, which really motivate us to uh, develop new theoretical uh, techniques uh, for studying far out of equilibrium dynamics. Uh, so, uh, but before we sort of jump into talking about uh, very like, specific approach uh, that uh, we have been developing in the last few years, and this is based on durational wave functions, uh, I uh, want to talk about like this couple of uh, experiments which I already mentioned, uh, like resonant X-ray scattering and photo-induced superconductivity as uh, examples uh, uh, of very uh, kind of non-trivial many-body dynamics uh, and which uh, sort of takes us outside the traditional paradigm of systems in equilibrium, linear response, uh, and so on. And I'll also give you uh, sort of uh, a brief review of uh, one of the more traditional approaches for looking at non-equilibrium states, which is based on uh, non-equilibrium keldish uh, greens functions, but this will be more uh, with the goal of illustrating uh, how technically challenging it is, and that's why uh, we will uh, we need to develop al sort of alternative tools uh, which are more practical. And so then we will move on to talk about variational wave functions. Uh, I'll uh, sort of uh, give a sort of general uh, conceptual introduction first, then uh, explain it uh, in cases uh, of bosonic systems. We'll start with something simple, like a set of coupled harmonic oscillators. Uh, then we'll uh, show that we can uh, use the seemingly uh, kind of simple uh, approach to get very non-trivial properties uh, of uh, uh, electron uh, of polarons in electron phonon systems. Then we'll talk about Gaussian uh, and that's in uh, electron systems, and I'll show you uh, how it can give uh, very interesting uh, results about the condom mode, including its non-equilibrium dynamics. And then we'll uh, talk about uh, kind of more general types of rational uh, wave functions and I'll focus on again, very specific, uh, one specific case which is electron phonon systems uh, as relevant to uh, the photo-induced superconductivity. Okay, so uh, let me uh, start by, uh, as I said, by giving you a few examples of interesting experiments uh, which uh, motivate us uh, to develop uh, new uh, ways of thinking about uh, non-equilibrium dynamics. So uh, this example will uh, deal with x-rays, so let me first uh, start by uh, reminding you uh, what tra how traditional x-ray scattering works. So if you open your uh, 
kind of standard textbooks on solid state physics say uh, they will uh, the, you will read that uh, x-ray scattering is a way of measuring uh, charge uh, correlation functions all like playing with light polarization you can also turn it into spin correlation functions so we have a uh, uh, like a photon x-ray photon coming in uh, it gets scattered then we look at momentum transfer to the photon we look at the uh, energy transfer uh, uh, to the photon so that's the momentum left by energy and momentum conservation that's the momentum left uh, in the system, the energy left in the system, and you use Fermi's golden rule to show that the intensity of scattered light with this momentum and energy transfer is exactly uh, the density density response function. Uh, so this is traditional uh, hard uh, X-ray hard meanings. It uses high energy uh, photons. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this technique uh, has a disadvantage uh, that. Uh, kind of the x-ray diffraction, uh, the, this hard x-ray diffraction is sensitive to all charges in the system. It's really dominated by nuclei and core electrons. And usually interesting mini-body physics occurs in the conduction band if we talk about strongly correlated systems. And this gives very uh, tiny contribution uh, to x-ray, so, uh, which makes it difficult to extract useful uh, information from uh, these experiments. So, uh, motivated by uh, this, uh, in the last uh, couple of decades, people uh, developed a new technique, and that's called resonant soft X ray. Again, soft means just they're using kind of low energy uh, photons. And, uh, but the key word here is that it's uh, resonant. So uh, now the incoming energy uh, of the photon is uh, tuned in such a way that it, it takes an uh, electron from the core orbital into the conduction band. So obviously this process uh, uh, is uh, kind of much more sensitive to what's happening in the conduction band since we're exciting the electron directly into uh, the conduction band. And uh, it has an advantage uh, that the uh, kind of cross sections uh, due to conduction band are amplified by a couple of orders of magnitude. So the signal is uh, very large. Uh, but it, this probe comes uh, with a price, uh, and this is uh, that it's actually it's more complicated. So in particular, we really have to uh, think about the role of uh, the core hole left behind, right? When we photo excite an electron, then there is a core hole left behind, and it can change uh, kind of uh, the uh, cross-section, as we'll uh, uh, see in a second. So uh, let me... We can just uh, show you one experiment, which actually was probably the uh, first experiment that got me at least intrigued uh, uh, about uh, this type of experiments. So uh, for those who uh, haven't worked in HTC, I'll not go through the details. Let me just point out uh, some general features. So uh, there is a regime uh, which uh, is superconducting. Right, uh, which corresponds to, uh, oh, sorry, I'm taking a step back. So we start with a mod insulator. Right, it's one electron per site, antifragmatic order. Uh, then we start doping. Uh, uh, beyond a certain doping, we get a superconducting state. For small doping, there are all kinds of uh, strange uh, behaviors. Uh, people talk about competing orders, strange metal. But then when doping is large enough, the system starts behaving like a conventional metal. And that's why it's usually called Fermi liquid. And uh, when people use traditional probe uh, of spin fluctuations, Right, they see very strong magnetic fluctuations uh, in the underdoped regime, but when they were doing experiments in overdoped regime, it looked like uh, you know this uh, was already uh, kind of like a good metal with very uh, little left in a way of strong magnetic fluctuations. Basically, the, the magnets, which were really sort of driving the unusual behavior uh, in the underdoped regime, uh, were very difficult to see. They were basically absent. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when people uh, applied resonant X-ray scattering, they uh, took very strongly overdoped sample and uh, interpreted experiments uh, in terms of magnets. So that's uh, uh, roughly how these measurements look like. So in this case, you can see several plots as a function of energy transfer. Right, and the, uh, so kind of at this point, just think about interpretation just like the usual x-ray. So the horizontal axis is energy uh, transfer and different lines correspond uh, to different momentum transfer. So you see uh, this kind of broad peak, but uh, 
uh, you always have to uh, sort of do some uh, data analysis. It turns out that you always get an elastic peak at zero energy, which arises from all sorts of things, including like sample holders. So that's something you have to subtract. Uh, and so just look now at this uh, kind of broader peak at finite energy. So this is basically uh, the uh, response of uh, the uh, many body system. And you can see a peak, right, which sees uh, and the position of the peak depends uh, on the momentum, right? So uh, this looks like some kind of uh, collective mode, right? It's broad, it's not a uh, very sharp peak, but yet it's uh, kind of a reasonably well-defined collective mode. And therefore, and that this was seen in different types of uh, overdoped cuprates, and therefore uh, uh, people doing this experiment suggested that while this is an indication uh, of magnons uh, present in the overdoped regime uh, of high temperature superconductors. And this, of course, is, is a very important question, right, whether we still have strong magnetic fluctuation or not, because this addresses, uh, goes to the core of the question, well, what's the mechanism of superconductivity, right, in the overdoped uh, regime? Okay, so uh, now let's uh, try to think uh, whether we can interpret uh, like, let's try to do a better theory of resonant X-ray uh, scattering. So, uh, question. yes, sure. sure. Uh, I've got a question. So, is there any interpretation of this model? Uh, so, what uh, about previous experiments? I'll explain you an alternative view on this. So, right, in order to give uh, a different explanation, uh, let's uh, actually look more carefully at uh, how to understand reson uh, this uh, resonant X-ray. So uh, as we said, what we are doing, we're uh, photo exciting electrons from the core orbital to the conduction band. While an electron uh, uh, in the core orbital is localized, it cannot move. Uh, and uh, so if we look at the kind of relevant matrix element, we start from the initial state. Think about this as just initial state uh, of the conduction band. We add electron into the conduction band. And uh, then we have an energy denominator, right? We have to, so it's like, it's really like second order perturbation theory, right? You, uh, we go to a virtual state when electron is promoted uh, to a high energy state, and then uh, we move back uh, to a lower energy state while emitting uh, a photon, right? And if you want to call, so you remember your second order perturbation theory, if you go from uh, initial uh, to the final state, okay, let's see. Right, so if you want to calculate matrix element from uh, initial to finite state, you have to sum over all intermediate uh, states. Uh, right, so you have a matrix element, can be N, N, uh, V divided by uh, the energy denominator. And that's uh, exactly what effectively uh, this expression uh, is, right? So uh, this, uh, this takes us into an intermediate state when we photo excite an electron. Uh, and this is the energy denominator of the intermediate state. And right, that's the end matrix element going to the final state when we actually move electron back into the core orbital. But what's uh, unusual about this uh, energy denominator is that this is not the original Hamiltonian of electrons in the conduction band, but this includes uh, the core hole potential. Right, something that's absent in the usual, like a usual correlation function, it includes just the original Hamiltonian of the problem. Okay, so uh, I'm sort of skipping some of uh, the uh, uh, formal durations, uh, but uh, w then you, when you calculate the, like once you have the matrix element, you can calculate uh, the uh, uh, amplitude square to get the intensity, and actually it's more convenient to write it as some kind of integral. Uh, evolution in time with some Fourier transforms. We can also think about it as kind of, you know, if you want to calculate Brian Ket, right? Remember, you have some initial state, you have evolution, but you have, if, if you have evolution on your initial state, it goes from the bra from the left and goes from the cat uh, uh, on the right. And that's uh, basically, you know, so we have the cat, so we created an electron, we evolved, uh, uh, or in the bra, we have to do the complex conjugate. But notice uh, something, uh, again, what, as we said uh, a second ago, that these evolutions are quite unusual. They include uh, the core hole uh, electron. Uh, so they include the potential due to uh, the core hole. So uh, therefore, 
we are not just adding electrons to the conduction band, we're actually adding an extra scattering of electrons, right? So the evolution will be much more complicated. It's really uh, like non-equilibrium dynamics. And uh, so uh, usually when people uh, sort of try to actually find uh, a way out of uh, this complicated problem, just trying to reduce it to something that they're used to, then uh, they use what's uh, uh, called ultra-fast collision limit, uh, basically, they assume uh, that the, this evolution uh, uh, with the core hole potential is not so important. So it can really be replaced by a C number, right? So we can take this entire minibody evolution and just replace it by a C number, which you can justify actually in principle if the lifetime of the core hole is very uh, short, but in reality it's not so short, right? Uh, and uh, so, but if you do this approximation, then you know this part of the evolution drops out, and then you see that, oh, uh, what we have is, uh, looks kind of very conveniently, so we have something which looks like a density or a spin operator, right, which are taken at the same time, uh, and then we evolve for some time, and then uh, we uh, sort of apply another density of spin operator. So in this ultra-fast, in the so-called UCL approximation, uh, then uh, the, uh, this resonant X-ray reduces to conventional uh, X-ray, but uh, as we saw, this can uh, give rise to this surprising uh, kind of interpretation uh, of seeing magnets where we don't see them with traditional uh, probes. Okay, so uh, now uh, again, I'll, uh, it's not something that I plan to cover. Just to throw the result at you, actually, you can do calculations. Uh, uh, for the full uh, time evolution, which includes the core hole potential. But at this point, you can, uh, uh, you can only do it if you assume that electrons are basically non-interacting. It's from a liquid type approach, which is kind of like what would be the right starting point if you believe that from a liquid is uh, the right description over the, over the overdoped regime. And then if one takes conventional uh, band structure parameters one, one introduces, like a reasonable number for the core hole potentials. So this black line is actually results of uh, the calculation. So we do get something that looks like a dispersing peak. So therefore, uh, you know, you don't actually have to talk about magnets. You can get the same uh, behavior uh, by uh, looking at dynamics. Uh, but, but you have to, in this case, really look at non-equilibrium dynamics, look at uh, how the Fermi C was uh, kind of being excited by the potential of the core uh, hole left behind. And this also helps to explain uh, some of the puzzles which were used, again, to argue uh, that uh, these results uh, uh, have to be interpreted as existence of magnets because uh, you remember, if we take non-interlocking non-interacting electrons, uh, if we calculate density, density response function or spin-spin response function, they coincide. This is the so-called famous Linhart uh, uh, response function, right? Linhart susceptibility. But in this case, when they looked at uh, uh, sort of, uh, as I said, by using light polarization, you can basically probe the spin channel and charge channel. You see that in the spin channel, the uh, peak appears at lower energy. Right. And therefore, the argument was, oh, this indicates that interactions are important to split the uh, energy, to split the uh, charge and uh, spin response function. Well, actually, when we talk about dynamics, even in uh, the model of non-interacting electrons, there is a difference of, uh, having a not, uh, of having a spin flip and not having a spin flip. When we photo excite an electron, right? So this electron uh, 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 is put onto a site uh, above uh, the uh, the core hole, and this electron has a certain spin, right? And then there is still Pauli principle, right? So which means that electrons with the same spin cannot come to the same site. And therefore, when you calculate the actual cross-section, uh, then you get uh, different uh, cross-sections uh, for processes with a spin flip and no spin flip. Uh, and that, again, without changing the numbers, so that's something once you sort of uh, uh, get uh, once you choose your potential for the core hole, as we said, standard band structure, you see the difference between uh, spin and charge channel. Or another surprise of uh, actually, this was uh, kind of first suggested theoretically that you know in traditional X-ray, uh, as we discussed, what really matters is the energy transfer, the incoming photon energy. The incoming photon energy is just not important. But in resonant, uh, if you think about details of resonant X-ray, 
the initial photon energy chooses which quasi-particles you excite, right? Because if I choose photon energy, I'll excite quasi-particles not at this energy, but at a different energy. And that's why there was a prediction uh, that there should be different uh, behavior, as a uh, that there should be different uh, response functions as a function of different incoming uh, photon energies. And indeed, uh, this is what was uh, verified then uh, experimentally. All right, you can, sorry, you can see this green color very well, but you see that the peak shifts and different lines here really correspond to different photon energies. So this uh, uh, kind of something, this mysterious behavior of experiments of resonant X-ray could be very well explained by uh, actually now calculating the uh, actual cross-section by thinking about resonant X-ray as an unequilibrium uh, process rather than the usual response function. But I, uh, the, uh, unfortunately, life is not so simple, so we can do uh, this analysis for optimally doped regime and get good agreement with experiment. That's where from a liquid uh, 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 kind of description is supposed to be accurate. But then as we go to more underdoped, in particular, antiferromagnetically uh, ordered, uh, like so very strongly underdoped materials, you see that, okay, uh, so the dots are experiments, the line are theory, that agreements become, uh, becomes very bad. So clearly, uh, and that's actually not surprising, when, as we said, when we come close to half filling, magnetic fluctuations become important. We are really dealing with strongly interacting electron systems. And unfortunately, it still remains an open challenge. So how to extend this analysis of dynamics to the strongly uh, interacting uh, regime? So any questions about this part? Yeah. I must, I, must, uh, I must say that we are now publishing a paper explaining uh, this um, uh, magnum peak in a broad uh, doping regime. So as a magnum peak? As a magnum peak. So okay, well, we can discuss this. I'm not kind of objective. But anyhow, anyhow, what's about other compounds? The mechanism you are proposing is quite universal. And yeah. If you are true, this must be seen in Yes. Basically any yeah, so that was actually, yeah, so we also showed that, uh, say, if you take YBCO, it has very different band structure. And therefore, for example, it will not have this dependence on incoming photon energy. Yeah, so actually we showed that this method is very sensitive to details of band structure and it is consistent and with experiments. About the experimental landscape, what do they see? Yeah, yeah, basically, yes. Yeah. So there is a difference in behavior of, let's say, the stalin based compounds in YBCO and this is consistent with this quasi-particle picture. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, now let me give you uh, my second example of uh, how an equilibrium can, can make things look very weird. And this is photo-induced superconductivity in, uh, this, uh, back in the buckyball superconductors, and this is primarily the work of uh, Andrea Cavalieri's group. Uh, so it's just one of the uh, several examples of optical control of uh, many body systems. There is also a sort of melting of uh, different types of charge and spin order. There are also similar experiment photo induced superconductivity in high TC cooperates. I'll just stick to this specific example. Okay, so uh, let me take you uh, uh, through uh, the key experimental observations. So this is basically an FCC uh, lattice, right, of K3C60. It's in equilibrium, it's a superconductor with a TC of 20 Kelvin. And uh, uh, one of the common experiments uh, is, uh, well, actually, the most relevant experiments for our discussion is measurements of optical conductivity. So the way it's done, you have a sample, they send light, at, look at light reflection, and uh, from uh, kind of the uh, Reflection coefficient, they can extract real and imaginary part of conductivity, right? So real is dissipative uh, and uh, uh, sort of like uh, imaginary part of conductivity, right, gives us kind of inertial part. Uh, so uh, in the normal state, we see that real part of conductivity has a finite a value at small frequency, right? That's our DC conductivity. When the system goes into the superconducting state, the gap opens up. Uh, and uh, so just look at this blue line, uh, sorry, the red line is a normal state, and then uh, blue line, right, is a superconducting state. And then if we take the superconducting state, then actually in the superconducting state, uh, we have one over omega tail in the imaginary part of the uh, conductivity, and you can understand this one over omega just by uh, recalling that uh, for small frequencies, 
current is accelerated by the electric field, right? And if I just simply put J is uh, like time dependences e to minus i omega t, I immediately find that the conductivity should go as i of i omega, right? So that's this i of, and the coefficient prefactor is just superfluid density, right? So this is kind of the uh, uh, canonical behavior of superconductor sigma two going as one over omega and sigma one uh, zero at small frequencies. There is obviously like a delta function at omega equal to zero. That's the DC, you know, kind of critical current. But you know, when we measure optically, we just measure finite frequency. And then uh, what was found experimentally is uh, that if they shine light, uh, it's mid infrared light resonant with phonons, uh, they start seeing a behavior uh, which looks superconducting like uh, a temperature which is higher than the equilibrium TC. That's count counterintuitive. Usually you think that if you send light, right, you just hit the sample, right, you should, it should suppress superconductivity, whereas here we see the enhancement. So this is, let's say, temperature of 25 Kelvin. And after they send light, you see that there is something which is like a gap opening up. And this one of omega tail appearing. And even a temperature as high as 100 Kelvin, we see the uh, kind of, again, the gap opening up and one of omega tail. Excuse me, is it more or less equilibrated picture or this is? Uh, nope. Uh, so that actually shows you. So if you look at changes in conductivity, it only lasts a few picoseconds. So it's really a transient state. And uh, so it's kind of short-lived. Obviously, the system cannot distinguish, uh, cannot establish true superconductivity during short time. So at best, we can talk about superconducting correlations. And uh, so this plot shows uh, that, OK, obviously, like, this effect gets stronger with increasing light intensity. And this also shows uh, that it has to do with phonons. So it only appears uh, if light is resonant with the phonon modes uh, present in the material. So some of you who are sort of are familiar with superconductivity know that uh, there is a so-called wired diam effect, which uh, or like in Russia often known as Eliasberg effect, because Eliasberg uh, explained it first, uh, which is uh, which corresponds to uh, sorry uh, enhancement of superconductivity by non-equilibrium distribution of uh, quasi-particles or fermionic quasi-particles. So this is very different uh, because energy scales are very different. Uh, so here we talk about energy scales which are much larger, so we're not excited, it's not for the particles on the scale of the gap, we're exciting really phonons. Okay, uh, actually, uh, since we're on the subject, I uh, sort of cannot resist just mentioning some of the things we're working on uh, also. So uh, another kind of cool thing which was seen in more recent experiments uh, is that when they started using uh, light pulses uh, which are more intense but shorter, then uh, they started seeing even uh, more surprising behavior, right? So usually how, let's say how, when we said that they uh, saw kind of sigma one go into zero, well, meaning no absorption. So what exactly uh, does it mean? Well, it just means that the reflection coefficient was one. All the light that comes in was reflected. You can also think about it as Meissner effect, right? As you know, like in superconductors, magnetic field is expelled. So if you send light at small frequency, which is sort of like almost a DC magnetic field, it cannot penetrate the sample. And that's why reflection coefficient is one. But when they started using this more intense shorter pulses, uh, they see, started seeing reflection coefficient, which is bigger than one, right? Okay, it may sound surprising. How can you get uh, more light uh, out than what you put in. But I remind you that this is, this is uh, a probe beam. This is uh, after we put in a, a kind of a pump pulse, right? So we already created a non-equilibrium state. Therefore, we shouldn't worry about energy conservation. We, by our pump, we made a non-equilibrium state. And now we can get reflection, which is bigger than one, uh, just by taking the energy that was put in previously by uh, this pulse. OK, so uh, but let me actually uh, elaborate. Uh, more on like a physical picture. So how, because it's really such a surprising phenomenon for to induce superconductivity. So uh, let me first give you a kind of uh, a general picture and then uh, sort of we will uh, gradually uh, develop tools for studying this more quantitatively. And I'll give you a very kind of biased presentations or other theories of uh, where this is coming from. I'll uh, uh, sort of be happy to talk about them off uh, line. Okay, so let me start by uh, sort of reiterating how surprising this is. Why uh, people sort of didn't even consider the possibility uh, that uh, we can enhance superconductivity by making an non-equilibrium state of phonons. Let's think about 
our basic uh, BCS uh, theory. So uh, it's the second order process, as you remember, like uh, superconductivity arises from attractive interaction between electrons mediated by a phonon. And we can think about this attraction using second order perturbation theory. Electron, uh, we have two electrons, right, at k, k minus k. The first electron emits a phonon, and then this phonon is uh, absorbed by the second electron. And uh, while well, as usually if we do second order perturbation theory, so we have matrix elements squared, we have energy denominator. So energy denominator, we have an uh, initial state which has electron at momentum k, and we have intermediate state, right, which has electron at momentum p, and an extra phonon. And uh, then if we have phonons present in the system, then you know that there are the usual Bose enhancement factors. Therefore, matrix element is multiplied one by, you know, one plus the number of phonons, which looks good, right? Uh, so if we are interested uh, in electrons near the Fermi surface, which is where conventional superconductivity resides, we can just set energies of electrons to be equal to zero, right? And we see this uh, attraction between electrons, which is electron phonon coupling squared divided by the phonon frequency and enhanced by the uh, Bose occupation factor. Okay, uh, looks like we actually are gaining something from uh, having an unequilibrium state of phonons. Well, but then you realize uh, that if you already have phonons in the problem, uh, then uh, you have to include another process uh, in which this electron is not emitting a, a, a phonon as an intermediate state, but actually absorbs one of the phonons which are already present in the system. Right. So in this case, uh, uh, we actually have an intermediate state which has one less phonon, right? And that's why the phonon energy comes with a minus sign. And now this process of uh, absorption of a phonon comes in with a factor of the number of phonons. And uh, if we add, and if we again set energies of electrons to zero, we find that we actually get repulsion between electrons, which is proportional to the density of phonons. So if we now add this kind of contributions from effective attraction and repulsion, we uh, see that the number of phonons just drops out exactly. Right. That's uh, where the usual kind of intuition comes from, uh, that uh, only virtual phonons can help us to enhance, uh, to uh, give superconductivity. Real phonons do not make a difference. OK, it looks like a very solid argument. Uh, how can we uh, get around it? So let's actually, uh, let me now consider a, a different way of making an unequilibrium state of phonons, not where I just simply start uh, with a kind of a wrong occupation number, but let me consider a situation where I have a parametric drive of phonons, right? So just to remind you, so if we think about phonons as harmonic oscillators, then parametric drive corresponds to a situation where one of the parameters is modulated in time. So for example, uh, the spring constant, right? Uh, is periodically modulated in time. So I'll tell you later why this is a reasonable model for what's happening in the superconnectors. For now, let's just uh, sort of see what, uh, what uh, this specific model of an unequilibrium state of phonons uh, can give us. So we know how to uh, calculate effective electron-electron interaction uh, if when phonons are in equilibrium. Now we have to calculate effective electron-electron uh, ele interaction induced by non-equilibrium phonons. So how do we do that? Okay, well, uh, uh, I'll show you kind of more rigorous ways of doing this. For now, let me appeal to a physical picture. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, basically in this physical picture, what you can uh, see is that effective attraction between electrons is actually determined by the uh, correlation function uh, of phonons are taking in whatever state they are, right? So we have, again, the matrix element, electron phone interaction squared times the response function. Okay, so how do we see this? Well, let me remind you, uh, just again, give you some uh, qualitative arguments. Let's take our uh, system, right? Let's say, so Q uh, is our phonon, right? Let's say this is our phonon Hamiltonian and we couple phonon to some external field phi. So uh, then we know uh, that when we uh, couple phonon, when we have linear coupling to the phonon, right, uh, then the phonon will be displaced from its equilibrium and there is a coefficient of proportionality, right, between the external force uh, and the uh, displacement. Uh, so, and the same uh, kind of dis uh, coefficient also controls uh, fluctuations in equilibrium. That's, uh, for example, the usual fluctuation dissipation theorem. But what's relevant to us is that if we apply uh, 
this external force, then the energy of uh, the phonons will be modified by the amount which is proportional to the square of the external field, and the prefactor is exactly the same response function. Right. Okay, so uh, now if you think about electron phonon interaction, so this Q is displacement of phonons, right? So then this electron density operator, which comes next, is like an external field. Right, applied to the phonons. And that's why we expect the change of the phonon energy to be quadratic in this external field, which means quadratic in electron density. This change comes with a minus sign, which means uh, its attraction. So that's the usual kind of uh, mattress effect, right? The first electron comes in, distorts the lattice, and then this lattice distortion attracts the second electron. We can, and as we said, that this strength of uh, this induced interaction is just a response function. OK, so uh, now how can we calculate response function in a non-equilibrium state uh, of phonons? Well, it's non-equilibrium, but so far it's uh, rather simple, right? Because uh, even though we have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, it's still quadratic. So for example, we can write equations of motion on the operators, right? On the displacement of the phonons and on momentum. OK, and they are sort of, OK, have time dependence, but it's something actually which uh, uh, it's not too complicated. So uh, in particular, what we can do if we want to calculate displacement at later time, we can relate it to displacements at earlier time or momentum at earlier time. What is important is that this is a linear set of equations, right? So when we calculate these kernels, which relate behavior at later time to earlier times, these kernels do not depend on the initial state. Right, because this is a linear system, they really depend just on the Hamiltonian, right, on the specific equations of motion, but they de do not depend on the initial time. And so when we calculate now response function, right, we have to relate, we have to take Q of t, right, and relate it to uh, Q at earlier time t prime, but then we know that Q of t uh, through this kernel we can relate to momentum, right, of P of t prime through this kernel, M of, uh, kernel of t and t prime. And that's why it, how this commutator has become instantaneous commutator, uh, right, which we know is canonical. So we see that the effective response function right, for phonons is actually just given by this kernel, which is controlled uh, by the Hamiltonian, this time-dependent Hamiltonian. But it does not depend on how many phonons we have. Right? And this is exactly uh, what you know the objection that we raised earlier was that the number of phonons should not matter. Well, it does not. And in fact, indeed, it doesn't matter in this case. However, we can modify the response function. Right? We can modify the effective uh, attraction between the electrons uh, if uh, our phonons are not equilibrium phonons, but they are driven. Right? And in particular, we know that when we are parametrically driving phonons, uh, we, uh, then we can excite the system uh, very strongly. We can uh, uh, sort of have a resonant response, which, which can enhance effective electron-electron interaction. So uh, you can see, for example, that let's say, okay, if this uh, driving frequency matches uh, the frequency of the phonons, uh, then uh, if we calculate this, like this is just perturbation theory uh, in uh, this uh, kind of external drive, you see that we get uh, some kind of like divergences when the drive frequency matches uh, the phonant frequencies. Nice yeah. Uh, I wonder, you say that uh, retarded during functioning, when phonology function enters into the equation for the electronic. Um, Please repeat it all out. So I mean, is, uh, uh, in this system uh, where you have a, a retarded green function, you don't really know about the phononic distribution function. Uh, like, uh, at this point, right, this is a hand waving argument. I'll throw at you, you know, all the childish, you know, nastiness in the next few slides. So am, am I understanding correctly that phon phonons will enter in the redistribution of the spectral function sphere? Energy sphere depends on... So you will see what happens uh, to phonons is, uh, the, in principle... OK, can I answer your question late? You'll see that... Uh, there are, you know, traditional effects of electron-phonon interaction. For example, effective mass of phonons get larger, right? So you will see that this is all happening. Just uh, because we changed, effectively, you can think about it as changing electron-phonon interaction. So does that answer your question? I mean, uh, in your initial, when you started uh, this topic, you said that you changed distribution of phonons 
and that's why I, I don't change the distribution. That was my whole point. I changed the Hamiltonian that controls the phonons. I see. So that was my uh, that that was the origin. You know why people uh, argue that you can like no matter what you do to phonons, it will not matter because they were thinking about distribution. I and see. I'm emphasizing it's not the distribution. It's the equation. It's the fact that phonons are not equilibrium phonons. They are driven. Thanks. Okay. Good. Other questions. OK, so, uh, but actually in this case, right, uh, equations uh, which control the dynamics, right, of phonons, uh, they are pretty simple. They can be solved exactly. There's a so-called Matthews equation, right? So you can calculate, you can get rid of these divergences, and you see that, yeah, indeed there is an enhancement uh, of the effective interaction. Uh, so actually, there are some interesting uh, new features, which at this point I'll just kind of point out. We, uh, that uh, you know this interaction is no longer kind of uh, time average, right? We have oscillations, but you can somehow see that this can also help us because if you remember your BCS formulas, uh, they depend in a very non-analytic way on the interactions. So therefore, if we uh, want to calculate kind of average DC, it's not it's not the same. You know, averaging this exponent is not the same as just averaging interaction. In fact, we get much more from enhancement of interactions than we lose from suppression. So this. Oscillations uh, of interactions uh, is also something that works in our favor. OK, but now I have to justify to you why uh, I uh, used this model uh, of you know, parametrically driven uh, phonons. So let me give you a few more facts about the system. So uh, OK, so we have a pump pulse, right? And actually, the pump pulse couples to uh, phonons that have finite matrix element to couple to light these are infrared active phonons. But these phonons are known not to couple to electrons very strongly. They do not sort of uh, play a major role uh, in uh, having superconductivity. However, what they uh, also, what the system also has, it has strong coupling between infrared phonons and Raman phonons, and it's now Raman phonons uh, which give rise to superconductivity. And then there are also the linearities of Raman uh, phonons themselves. Therefore, we should really look at kind of multi-stage process. So we have pump pulse that couples to infrared active phonons. And these infrared active phonons, they excite Raman phonons. And already these Raman modes are the ones which drive super, which enhance uh, kind of, uh, which have strong interaction with electrons and which enhance superconductivity. And so now if we uh, think about, OK, light induces infrared uh, sort of uh, induces a coherent state of infrared uh, phonons uh, at q equal to zero because speed of light is so high that momentum transferred by light is basically zero. Uh, so we have expectation value uh, of uh, uh, of uh, infrared phonons at q equal to zero, which then for Raman phonon induces uh, also coherent state at q equal to zero. Uh, but then if we look at nonlinearity. Uh, of uh, Raman phonons uh, themselves, then we can now factorize, right? Because we say, oh, I have uh, expectation value of Q equal to zero. And in fact, it's oscillating, right? Because it's really driven by the infrared uh, phonons. So now this looks like a classical drive, which couples to the square of my displacement of a phonons at finite Q, right? Now this looks like a parametric drive on my finite Q phonons. Uh, and the same if I take high order nonlinearity, right? Again, I have uh, Raman. Uh, I have, sorry, I have, uh, uh, yeah, expectation value of Q equal to zero, now squared coupling to uh, the finite Q. And, uh, and I remind you that when we talk about superconductivity, we really need to integrate over the entire Brillouin zone. It's really phonons at large momenta which contribute the most uh, just because of phase space. So we cannot just say, oh, we only worry, uh, we only consider what's happening for phonons at q equal to 0. We include phonons at all wave vectors in order to understand uh, uh, enhanced electron-electron interaction. So uh, again, let me sort of take a step uh, back and uh, you know, just try to put things in perspective. So when we talk about superconductivity, you remember that the kind of textbook formula for effective interaction, something that we also saw in the second order of perturbation theory, Effective interaction is electron phonon coupling constant squared divided by the phonon frequency. Therefore, if we want to get a larger effective uh, interaction, then uh, one of the roots is to soften the phonon frequency, right? And that's why 
uh, we often find support connectivity when the phone and gets soft when the system is close to some structural phase transition, right? So that's kind of canonical phase diagram, some kind of, uh, let's say, charge density wave order has a transition temperature going to zero, and then at the boundary there is, there is a superconducting state. So in a sense, uh, what we are uh, doing, uh, what uh, we're advocating is a scenario in which we're inducing very similar phone on softening, but dynamically. Right, because you know that if you parametrically drive uh, your phonon, then the system can also become unstable, right, if you drive very strongly. And uh, so we can also get this effective phonon softening, but now it's kind of dynamical driving. So this shows you, let's say, this regions of instability and effective phonon frequency goes to zero as we approach uh, this uh, instability uh, point. So we're still kind of utilize, we're sort of utilizing the, like, whereas usually it would be like a quantum critical point where the phonon frequency goes to zero. Here we're sort of inducing it dynamically, right? Because when we par parametrically drive uh, uh, phonons, right, they're like harmonic oscillators, they become very responsive, right, when they're about to become unstable, right, due to very strong drive, you can imagine that then a small perturbation induced uh, by the first electron has much more dra dramatic effect on now this very susceptible uh, uh, kind of phonon system. Okay, so uh, let's uh, continue. Uh, so before uh, I start telling you about uh, a way of understanding superconductivity uh, from the point of view of like full non-equilibrium Kerdish functions. Uh, let me sort of tell you a story. So, well, it's just like a historical anecdote. Uh, you know that Galileo published his book, like which was a criticism, right, uh, of Ptolemaean system. And the way he, uh, actually formulated it was, of course, very subtle because uh, he was a faithful Catholic, right? And there was already basically uh, a dict of the Pope saying, oh, you know, Catholics should not, uh, uh, should not sort of subscribe to this uh, uh, Copernican system uh, that, you know, like it's really the earth and the sun rotates uh, around the, uh, the earth. Uh, that, and, you know, and this Copernican system was actually uh, rather uh, at this point uh, was advocated by Protestants, so that was like, considered to be a heresy. So the way, and of course, like, uh, so for Galea that was a problem, but the way he uh, tried to formulate his book was to say, well, as Catholics we know uh, that it's really the sun that uh, rotates around the earth. However, uh, you know, it's not because we're ignorant, it's not because we don't know experiments. So that's why, let me uh, sort of present this other point of view uh, as uh, in order to emphasize uh, that even as Catholics we actually know how uh, like all how uh, we could explain things uh, in uh, uh, like uh, from this Copernican point of view and because we know this we uh, can criticize them. So uh, that's in some sense is also uh, the logic that I'm using here. Like uh, most part of my lectures will be a way of uh, uh, sort of finding an alternative to traditional diagrammatic techniques. But uh, I don't want it to look as if, well, we criticize it from the position of weakness. Well, actually, we sort of try to find alternatives because we know how to do this Keldish approach. And I'll give you a flavor of it. And, uh, one of the main points that I'll try to make, it's just really hard, just technically. <laughs> it's just very painful. Uh, it's powerful, but it's painful. And uh, so I'll at least show you what I, I still I want to introduce you, kind of the flavor of how this uh, can be done. And uh, uh, that, like once we understand the challenges uh, for uh, uh, sort of solving an equilibrium problems this way, that will be kind of a motivation for trying to look for uh, alternatives. Okay, so, uh, and let's say, uh, so if uh, you have looked, studied field theory before, I presume many of you uh, have done this, uh, then this will be kind of uh, very, at least it should give you a, a kind of general idea, although I, I doubt that you will be able to follow every step, right? Uh, because I'm skipping most of the technical uh, details. If you uh, kind of were not really exposed to Green's functions, and like few theoretical methods, 
Okay, so maybe you can tune out for the next uh, few minutes, so at least appreciate kind of the uh, mathematical complexity, but don't forget to sort of start following again because we will introduce a completely new method uh, in, uh, in a few slides. Uh, so this is really just, uh, as I said, uh, kind of a detour from the main uh, subject. Okay, so if we want to describe uh, uh, electron phonon system, right, then we have to start uh, uh, like with uh, an effective model, right, so we have electrons and we have phonons, right, so phi is a phonon field uh, now, so we sort of change notation somewhat, and then we have uh, phonons coupling to electrons, and uh, now we uh, sort of take a very simple uh, uh, model in which we do not solve all, like, because remember I told you that there is a pump beam which couples to uh, infrared active phonons, which then couples to Raman. So I take uh, up the problem starting from the Raman phonon, so I treat infrared active phonons as a classical field. So we have this classical drive, right? So you can see uh, it's a classical drive at momentum zero, that's why it couples to phonons at Q equal to zero, and then we include nonlinearities between uh, phonons. So again, as you know, like, okay, there is, there has to be, we have to now define things in terms of uh, Green's functions and uh, uh, there is a consistent way, uh, like you have to make sure that you do not violate conservation law. So there is a consistent way of doing this, which is sort of called Cardan of Bain procedure. I, again, as I said, I'm uh, skipping this. Uh, I will just sort of uh, jump into equations, which we have, let's say, just for four nodes. So this phi, right, is a displacement of phonon at Q equal to zero, right? That's something which is induced uh, by the external drive. And you can see that, okay, the first equation just gives us, well, uh, it's a harmonic oscillator, right? We have time derivative, we have its own uh, frequency. Uh, then we have external drive, and then we have nonlinearities. Uh, and now because, uh, so, but these are nonlinearities which are all connect kind of the phonon field at Q equals zero to itself. But we also have contribution of phonons at finite Q, right, which is in this last term. And on the other hand, we also have to look at dynamics at finite Q. And for uh, phonons at finite Q, we cannot get an expectation value of a finite Q, right? We, uh, uh, because uh, as we saw, like what's happening is we're not coupling linear to phonon, uh, phonons at finite Q, right? Uh, so we cannot. Like, you know, if, you, if uh, we have external drive at momentum equal to zero, it doesn't break translational symmetry. We cannot have any uh, uh, kind of expectation value at finite Q, but we can have uh, enhanced correlations at finite Q. And that's described by the Green's function, right? And uh, because this, uh, this is a non-equilibrium uh, problem, then actually Green's function uh, has to be written as a function of both times. Right. Unfortunately, uh, uh, we cannot do the same simplification as in equilibrium, where you assume that the Green's function just depends on the time difference. Uh, and uh, okay, so you ha uh, we have to solve this coupled equation, but unfortunately, you can see these are integral equations in time, uh, and uh, they include this periodic driving. And if we, you know, in most problems which deal with non-equilibrium uh, of electron and phonon systems, uh, uh, they are. You can do this approximation where you say, okay, I have Green's function, which depends on two times, but I can separate kind of like the center of mass time, which is like the average of the two times. And, for the, re and the relative time is something which corresponds to electron energies, like e Fermi, which is very fast. So I just assume that I have very slow dependence on the center of mass time t, fast dependence on t1 minus t2, and I take care of this fast relative time dependence by doing a Fourier transform. Well, unfortunately, in this case for phonons, you know, we have external drive at the frequency close to phonon frequencies, so we cannot really, uh, uh, we cannot say that our center of mass time is sort of dependent on center of mass time is slower than the relative time. Uh, so uh, therefore, what uh, we have to do is we actually have to break dependence uh, even on the center of mass times into this kind of ampli different Flaquet amplitudes. Right, so, uh, uh, and only after we separated different Flaquet amplitudes, uh, then we can say that every one of these Flaquet amplitudes is a slow function uh, in time. So, okay, actually it's something that, uh, the, the trick really came from uh, kind of Mertash uh, Babadi, who interestingly, like in his undergraduate career, was an electrical engineer, and this is a very common tool in electrical engineering. If you have a signal, right, which changes uh, rapidly in time, uh, then what you can do, you can introduce a window function, right? So as long as so you have uh, 
some kind of like oscillating uh, frequency omega right in the corresponding period uh, and so if you can introduce the time scale right such which is much larger than uh, this kind of the period of the fast oscillation yet it is uh, smaller than uh, the time evolution uh, of uh, of the kind of envelopes of every one of uh, the amplitudes, then uh, you can actually use uh, this uh, separation, right? So that's the representation uh, of the Green's function. But you can see that things are getting very nasty, right? Your usual equilibrium Green's function, they just depend on frequency. Now you have dependence on frequency, uh, you have dependence on the center of mass time, and you have different uh, uh, Flaquet amplitudes. And so, uh, therefore, you know, okay, if you start writing, let's say, when you start writing equation, which I wrote to you before, uh, they become not only differential equation in time, but also have to sum over this, you know, Flaquet indices, right? In addition, they also uh, carry uh, frequency dependence and so on. Again, as I said, I'm not giving you all the details. I just want to show you, well, it gets nasty very rapidly. Uh, so uh, now there was a question, right? So what's happening to phonons? You can see that actually what's happening to phonons is yeah, the frequency is changing. They're getting soft, which is useful to us because you remember uh, as phonons get softer, uh, we can enhance TC. They also get broader. We get sort of like here, because we're driving at some finite frequency, we see some kind of satellite versions uh, uh, of the response functions. And then after we solve the equations for phonons, we have to solve uh, uh, Green's function for electrons. So this is, you know, the usual Migdal-Eliasberg theory for electrons, how properties of electrons are renormalized. Uh, but in this case, as I said, it's actually, it gets uh, much harder just because, you know, we're dealing with phonons uh, for which uh, the spectral function has changed, right? Because it's like basically think about it as dispersion has changed, occupation number has changed. And this gives us the same thing for uh, electrons, uh, that the dispersion changes, the distribution function changes. OK, uh, so let me just show you uh, the results. Uh, so this is uh, basically uh, what you one would see by doing angular resolved photo emission. Like, so that's usually, uh, like in technical language, it's imaginary part of the Green's function. For people who are not familiar with this, it's really think about this as uh, an amplitude to find an electron at a certain momentum. So psi is like momentum relative to uh, k Fermi, and omega is energy. So this is before we applied the drive. Uh, one thing you can see, it's a king. So this is the kind of the canonical signature of electron phonon interaction, a king in the dispersion, right? So this uh, king in the dispersion indicate that there was a change in effective mass due to electrons interacting with phonons. Uh, what is also, uh, important is before we apply the drive, you see that the width of the peak is very small, right? We have very well-defined quasi-particles uh, at close to the Fermi surface. And uh, uh, this is what we expect, right? At the Fermi energy, the, uh, we should have well-defined Fermi quasi-particles. Now just follow to what's happening to the spectral function as we uh, apply the drive. So first of all, while we're getting Flaquet reflection, basically sort of like uh, versions of the dispersion at frequency shifted by the drive frequency, okay, that's expected. Actually, uh, the kink uh, is modified. That's something that uh, may not be obvious here, but basically that's what is indicated on this plot. You can see this is effective mass. So effective mass is really the slope. And uh, the larger is electron phonon, like in equilibrium, usually effective mass is a signature, right? Uh, as we said, of electron phonon interactions. The larger is the mass, the more electrons are dressed in phonons. So that's an indication of stronger electron phonon coupling. And you can see that effective mass is going up in time, which means that, yeah, we are getting enhancement of electron phonon interactions. So that's good, right? That's because uh, that was our starting point. Somehow we want to find a way to enhance electron phonon interaction in order to get kind of transient TC. But this comes, uh, this enhancement comes with a price. If you look uh, at the width of the peaks at the Fermi energy, you see that actually it gets larger, right? Because the particles get very broad. So, uh, which means uh, that electrons become very incoherent. And that's actually bad for pairing, right? You can see here, so this gamma, it's like this width, starts from a small value and just shoots up. And that, so therefore we have two competing effects. One is Enhancement of electron phonon interaction, uh, which is good for superconductivity, but the other is uh, 
uh, sort of uh, suppression of coherence for electrons, which is bad for superconductivity. And so the outcome is not obvious. Uh, in order to do this, uh, we have to, uh, you know, uh, find, we have to solve what in the technical language is the Eliasberg equations, right? We real Migdal uh, Eliasberg equations. So uh, we real roughly you can think about it if you recall your basic BCS equation, right? So what's TC? Well, you're asking when do we have the first non-trivial solution, right, for this equation? But there is just one parameter, right, which is delta. So now we, uh, what we're doing is we're calculating eigenvalues of a certain matrix, right? And when eigenvalues become negative, this means uh, that non-trivial solution of this BCS equation is uh, positive. And uh, so this basically shows you the behavior of uh, the eigenvalues uh, that they, like before we uh, turned on the drive, uh, then it's positive, meaning that superconductivity is not favorable, right? We do not have non-trivial BCS-like solution. Uh, but then as we turn on the drive, they actually become negative, meaning, oh, now actually the system can have non-trivial uh, solution. But then uh, very rapidly uh, decoherence comes in and actually again makes eigenvalue positive, which indicates that this is indeed a transient state. Uh, that's the question that Alexei asked earlier. Well, is it a steady state? No, it's not. So we only get, you know, when uh, the superconduct enhancement of superconductivity while uh, electron f uh, when electron phone interaction has already become large enough, yet electrons did not become too incoherent. And uh, again, just in a sense, like in technical point of view, it's really like this nasty matrix where you have to keep track of, you know, uh, uh, the uh, frequency component, uh, you have to keep track of the center of mass time, uh, and uh, you have to keep track of uh, the Flaquia eigenvalues. But this, okay, once you do this, you can calculate the enhancement uh, of TC. So uh, actually, in this case, uh, what we didn't take, you know, all the, de the actual details uh, of the uh, kind of, uh, of this buckyball materials into account, right? The actual materials, they have three bands, they have five branches of phonons. Uh, as I, you saw in the beginning, we took a very simple mode. There was just one uh, band of electrons. Uh, there was just very simple coupling of electrons, uh, electron phonon of the hosting type. That's why we shouldn't compare uh, kind of numbers, like, okay, how big is the enhancement of TC that we find compared to TC enhancement uh, in experiments? Uh, kind of our logic was, well, uh, this phenomenon should be universal for this to be interesting. It, if it's very special to, you know, this specific band structure, this specific electron phonon interaction, that's not so exciting. Uh, but it, so therefore we want to ask kind of matter of principle question, can we have this transient TC enhancement? And the answer appears to be yes. Like, so in this simple model, we can have a TC enhancement like of 150%. So it's not as big as like a factor of five, which we saw in experiments, but that, as I said, because we took a rather uh, simplified uh, model. Questions? Yeah. I think that maybe you said it, like, I mean, so if you just go to rotating frame approximation and just renormalize energy denominators and then forget about driving everything, just use a static picture, can, can you recover some of this or? No. So, so for example, what you can do is, I don't have these plots here, uh, you can artificially suppress all the flaquet components and just ask what you will get. And what you typically find is uh, uh, that mostly you get suppression rather than enhancement, or you get very tiny enhancement. So you know, this flag, the fact that it remains flaque is very important. So I cannot get it just by taking, you know, this average time averaged components. How many flaque components should you get? So uh, in this case, I think we found that going beyond three or four did not make a difference. So we tried more, but then it just stopped making any difference. So we just limited ourselves to those three or four. But not one, right? Yes, yes. OK, so uh, now there is, as I said, uh, it's like this, you know, kind of diagrammatic techniques, kind of real Russian school, very powerful, but really hard. So we have to, uh, the uh, kind of main goal of uh, the rest of the lectures will be to try and introduce you an alternative variational uh, approach and uh, I'll give you a preview uh, of uh, this right now so that you sort of could see where we're going and then we'll sort of take a step back to uh, sort of define the formalism. <laughs>
So uh, the uh, variational approach is actually something that's uh, uh, known uh, in the uh, kind of context of electron phonon interaction. And this comes under the name of Polaron transformations. So let's again take a very simplified model, right? Just single band of electrons, uh, one branch of phonons, and we have a phonons coupling to electron density. So this is uh, the so-called hosting Primakov transformation. Uh, sorry, hosting model. Sorry, hosting model. And now what we can do, uh, we can do a unitary uh, transformation. Okay, sorry, I didn't uh, write it. So the unitary transformation is really defined as uh, u equals e times s. Right, and this S is shown here. So you can think about this as, uh, uh, can it's basically, this is way distorting phonons uh, in, in a way which depends on, uh, on the electron densities, right? So, uh, so if you recall, right, uh, that if we, like in the regular quantum mechanics, if we take transformation, right, E to I, P A, right, and then we take U dagger, right, X U, then we get X plus A, right. The, so if we think about X uh, as like a displacement of a phonon, right, if, so if we do a unitary transformation which involves momentum uh, coupled to something, it corresponds to a displacement uh, of the particle. So in this case, right, clearly this, uh, B, if I think about, you know, creation annihilation operators as the usual like as uh, creation annihilation operators for harmonic oscillator. This is like x, this is like displacement of a phonon, and now this b minus b dagger, this is like momentum. So I am displacing phonons, and the amount of displacement depends uh, on the electron configurations. And you can uh, do this transformation, it's exact. Uh, what the upside is uh, that by doing this, you actually induce uh, immediately effective electron-electron interaction, which is what we want. That's our kind of starting point for uh, making, uh, writing BCS type model. Uh, the price that you pay is that now hopping uh, uh, of electrons, right, gets dressed uh, by phonons, right? And that's what's called polaronic dressing because you can say, well, uh, when the electron is on the first side, the phonon system somehow adjusts to it. Now electron moves to the second side, the phonon bath has to adjust to the new position uh, of the electron. And what, uh, sorry, and uh, what's usually done, right, when people talk about superconductivity, uh, they would uh, say, okay, well, uh, we just want to start with a good BCS model, so let's average uh, this with respect to a phonon equilibrium, right, with respect to, say, vacuum of phonons if we're at zero temperature or some thermal uh, uh, equilibrium state of phonons. This will give us kind of uh, polaronic reduction of electron hopping, uh, and we have effective electron, uh, electron interaction. So while we get, you know, we can basically, we treat this J as a number, right, and we have a attraction. So we get BCS model and we can write our mean field. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me. What's uh, the advantage of this particular transformation? What's what? Uh, what's the advantage? Uh, I mean, uh, you can get an effective interaction by various kinds of free transformations. Why choose this? Uh, for electron phonon systems, there are not so many. Okay, we can talk about this, but that I would say uh, that's probably like if you uh, later on when you have just uh, if you have just one electron in a phonon system, there is another canonical transformation which is called Lilo Pines. You will see it. But when you have m many electrons, I'd say this is the main one. I mean, if you are doing things non perturbatively, you can do like Schrift for Wolf perturbatively. But this is non perturbative, that's exact. Well, in fact, actually, what we will do later on is we will generalize this, you know. Like, in this transformation, you sort of, you do a very fixed type of transformation. And once, uh, your goal is to somehow try, okay, maybe, okay, maybe that's an answer to your question. If the logic of this transformation, we have this linear coupling of phonons to electrons. And by doing this transformation, you are trying to eliminate this term, right? So, okay, maybe that's how I should have answered it. Uh, so, uh, because if you do this transformation, if you choose the numbers as I showed you here, this term is gone. Of course, you pay the price that now phonons appear uh, in the hopping. Uh, but, and the logic was, oh, that's probably okay, because at least we see that the physics uh, uh, is correct. But in our case, right, we know that somehow the nature of phonons is changing. So we cannot really, uh, so at least it's not clear why we should keep the same uh, uh, fixed electron phonon uh, transformation. And in fact, uh, what uh, we will 
do is we will generalize uh, the selection for phonon transformation in a way in which it still has a very similar kind of structure. So we have like momentum uh, uh, of uh, phonons, uh, which is something, an operator which will displace a phonons, which couples to electron density. But now uh, this coefficient, like how much we displace phonons in respect to density transformation will by itself a function of time. Right. So we will take, so I'll, if you haven't seen what's a Gaussian uh, uh, wave function uh, for, let's say, uh, uh, fermions or bosons, I'll define it uh, later on. Uh, but the key element of what we're doing, we'll, we'll be doing is that we will do this transformation, which actually, uh, uh, which are much richer than what people have been defined before. And uh, again, just to uh, uh, throw the uh, general philosophy uh, of this variation of wave functions, so the idea is roughly the following. So we have to solve, like we have to solve Schrodinger equation, like the wave function evolves with the Hamiltonian. So, okay, we say it's complicated. We find it difficult to solve it uh, exactly, but we can write a kind of uh, variational class of states. And this class can be, we believe is sufficiently rich. It captures most of the essential physics. So we can like in our Hilbert space, right? Uh, let's say we have the surface which basically denotes class of wave functions, uh, which we can study. So we're saying we want to project dynamics onto this variational class of uh, wave functions. And now if I look at the change of my uh, wave function, right? So it's basically something like, you know, from uh, the uh, Schrodinger equation, we can just say, uh, right, d psi, right, is one over i h psi right, uh, h psi times dt. So uh, I have this change uh, of my wave function, uh, which is determined by the Hamiltonian. But generically, this obviously takes me outside uh, of my variational class of states, outside of you know, this manifold. So then what I have to do, I have to take this change of the wave function, and I have to project it onto the tangential plane. Right? And basically, I define tangential plane by asking, uh, OK, so what's the freedom of wave functions that I have? If I change parameters right, in my variational wave function, I'll have basis vectors. And then what I have to do, I'll just have to project the change in the wave function onto basis vectors on this tangential plane. And once I uh, have the projection, I can write the time evolution uh, of, uh, of parameters uh, of my uh, variational state. Uh, so you, as you see, uh, instead of you know, solving uh, integral differential equation and the Green's function, uh, what this reduces to, uh, OK, at least you can already see the structure, it will become differential equation, although this will be nonlinear differential uh, equations. But they're still much more tractable. OK, but I uh, still uh, want to, uh, OK, and yeah, so I, uh, now what I want to show you is that actually this technique can uh, give us uh, some interesting insights. So for example, we can go back to uh, this, uh, remember we talked about this uh, reflection coefficient, which was uh, of light uh, in the transient superconducting state, which was bigger than one. So now let's uh, see how uh, this can emerge. So again, I'm sort of in some sense, I'm trying to give you uh, the highlights of what we can do with the new approach. Uh, so that you will then have some patience to go with me through the details uh, of the calculations. So, uh, okay, so uh, again, I'm just summarizing results which we can get from this variational uh, approach uh, to electron phonon uh, interactions. And, uh, and this, as you'll see, is actually uh, can uh, uh, explain what we saw in this puzzling Cavalieri's experiments. So now let's can actually, uh, as the first, uh, Question, let's consider uh, kind of somewhat a Gedanken experiment, right? Uh, so we're not pumping uh, phonons, just as you know, we went through all the details of what's happening. But now, let me take a simplified picture. Let's assume that I'm just suddenly changing the electron phonon coupling constant. So, uh, and I'm asking, so how will my uh, system behave? Okay, so then if you, uh, Clearly, if I change electron phonon, uh, so if I change, yeah, change electron phonon interaction, then I can make the system uh, more can it can become superconductivity more favorable. So if we think about uh, and uh, uh, and I want to uh, ask a question, well, so how will the order parameter behave uh, as a function of time? 
And if we take the usual picture of a broken symmetry state as something that uh, arises from the Mexican, well, that can be described as a Mexican hat potential, right? Remember when we have uh, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, we have an order parameter, which in our case is a superconducting gap, and we have a minimum, right? And this degeneracy just corresponds to the phase of the order parameter. Uh, and uh, uh, when we think about, say, collective excitation, again, this is just a reminder, then we have two types of excitation, one in which just the phase is changing, that's the famous uh, Goldstone mode, or we have a degree of freedom which has to do with the amplitude of the order parameter changing, it's the Anderson-Higgs mode. Uh, and here, uh, if we change electron phonon coupling constant, let's say to go to larger values, so we can start in a regime in which our Mexican hat has just one minimum, right? We don't favor having a superconducting state. Then we make electron phonon interaction larger, which means, oh, now we have parameters which correspond to, uh, uh, which would make it possible to have a superconducting state. So we kind of open up uh, this Mexican hat to have a minimum at finite value of the order parameter. And then our system, right, which we represent, represent like a point, it has to s sort of slide down towards the new minimum. But, you know, the motion generically is not overdamped. And uh, that's why as the particle slides down, it will not just sort of gently roll to the new minimum, it will actually start oscillating, right? So we expect to excite the Anderson-Higgs mode just because we non-adiabatically change the electron phonon uh, interaction. And that's what actually you can uh, calculate by uh, looking at this variational wave function. So uh, what's shown here is, uh, so this is time, right? So we always, uh, we change electron phonon interaction from some initial state to some finite state. And we choose finite, final state to always be four, right? So that's why, you know, if initial is four, then nothing is changing in time. Then we just didn't change parameters. But if we start with, uh, smaller value of g or larger value of g, just as long as we change it, you see that the, so this is color coding of the superconducting gap, we see that the gap is actually changing in time, it's oscillating, right? That really shows you this uh, Higgs-like oscillation that have been induced. So let me actually remark that the idea that if you change something in the BCS model, you get oscillations has a long history. Say, uh, most recently it was studied by uh, Levitov, Fusbashan, Alt Schuller, but uh, they already worked uh, with just the BCS models. They did not have phonons in their problem, but they also saw oscillations. So we put more physics, uh, we put, put more complications here because we start with changing electron phonon interaction and therefore uh, our phonons also get excited as we change electron phonon interaction. Yeah? And what is the final state? Uh, we, uh, we didn't actually go to long enough time, uh, so basically we get damped oscillations, like whether it will become true thermal equilibrium or not is an interesting question, we didn't look at it. Yeah, whether, this is, whether in this approximation the system thermalizes or not, okay, I don't know yet. Because for instance, uh, Al-Schuller and Yusbashian, they have considered an integrable system. That's correct. That's correct. In this case, it's non integrable because we have more degrees of freedom. Therefore, we have more mechanisms uh, of, uh, of decoherence and of decay. Yes. Okay, so, uh, but for now what uh, uh, we do is, we, so we have this order parameter as a function of time. Okay, it looks like we have oscillations. It's natural to take Fourier transform just to see what is the nature of oscillation. So that's what's shown here and you can, see, so this is now frequency uh, and uh, this is color coding of the Fourier component. Again, this is different values of initial uh, uh, value of electron phonon interaction and we always end up at four. So, okay, at if we start at four, right, nothing has changed. We just don't have any spectrum. But, and then we have this very uh, kind of sharp branch. And you can see that if the quench was small, then the frequency is close to twice the equilibrium gap. And that's exactly the, uh, what you calculate as a, collect as a collective mode frequency. But actually, you see that if the quench has a finite amplitude, the frequency is somewhat shifted. But it's still a kind of a close cousin uh, of the... Uh, of the Higgs mode. It's just renormalized because we're looking at nonlinear system and we have a finite amplitude. So therefore, the, we're actually by uh, having this non-equilibrium, uh, uh, sorry, non-adiabatic change of electron phonon coupling, uh, we can, uh, we're not just getting kind of a new superconducting state, we'll get a su superconducting state with oscillations uh, of the order parameter. Okay, uh, so, uh, now we can actually, so we saw this uh, kind of uh, mechanism of exciting the Higgs mode if we change electron phonon coupling. 
Now we can do, uh, consider something more realistic when we actually just apply this parametric driving of phonons. Again, something that you can do with uh, this variational approach. And uh, you can see that we get something very similar, like this is again Fourier spectrum uh, of the order parameter. And we have one branch, uh, we are dominated by this uh, and one specific type of oscillation which approaches to delta, so it's still the same Higgs. So it's still kind of consistent with uh, what uh, uh, we saw before uh, uh, that, uh, you know, we, uh, that when we change, uh, when we start parametrically driving phonons, we effectively change electron phonon interaction, right? And that's can, and so at least the kind of qualitative signatures to what's happening then uh, are rather similar. Okay, but so how can we uh, uh, connect this to uh, experiments by Andrea Cavalieri? So this is something that uh, we sort of uh, call the Higgs laser, or maybe like a more better technical notation would be Higgs amplifier, but you know, Higgs laser just sounds more cool. Uh, okay, so uh, the argument is actually, uh, uh, very simple. So let's actually even take a step back. This type of picture I can give you even without doing all this detailed calculation of electron phonon interaction. Let's uh, simply analyze electromagnetic properties of a superconductor with an excited Higgs mode. Right? So we said that just because we changed this kind of Mexican hat from having a single minimum to having uh, uh, this kind of like a whole, uh, uh, like, uh, like a full minimum uh, at finite value of the amplitude of the order parameter if, when we excite these oscillations. Uh, uh, that's what we call the Higgs mode. I will argue that this state, like a superconductor with an excited Higgs mode, should generically have this feature. Uh, oh, well, it depends on details. It, at least it generically may have this feature that reflection coefficient may be bigger than one, that it can act as an amplifier. And you can see this from something as uh, simple as uh, Maxwell equation. So let me remind you, how do we solve the problem of uh, light reflection from an interface? Well, we basically have to solve Maxwell equations, right? So these are familiar Maxwell equations. Maxwell equations uh, have currents. So in order to get the, uh, if you remember your optics classes, like so the reflection coefficient are given by the so-called Fresnel formulas. And in order to derive Fresnel formulas, you have to supplement uh, Maxwell's equation by relation between current and electric field, or pol polarization and electric field. In the case of superconductor, uh, when we're looking at small frequencies, so let's uh, neglect, uh, like for now, uh, dissipation coming from quasi-particles, but that's probably a reasonable assumption because we're talking about small frequencies below the quasi-particle gap. So then relation is simply that, okay, current uh, is proportional to superfluid density times the superfluid velocity. And the time derivative of superfluid velocity is electric field. Electrons are accelerated, or Cooper pairs are accelerated by the electric field. And so in the usual superconductor, the superfluid density is constant. But now we have oscillations, which means that the superfluid density is oscillating in time. So therefore, we still sort of go back to the usual kind of uh, Fresnel equations. But the new subtlety is uh, that the coefficient in this uh, kind of relation between current and electric field are no longer constant. They have an oscillatory component. Therefore, it is a flakia type problem. And this actually uh, allows uh, for uh, a very peculiar property. It turns out that Higgs oscillations can spontaneously generate pairs of photons. So you can uh, understand it from the following argument. So it's actually known uh, that Higgs excitation can decay into Goldstone modes, right? And so uh, what's a Goldstone mode in a superconductor? Well, it's something that involves like a gradient of the phase. And what's a gradient of the phase? Well, it's current. And current is obviously coupled to light, to electric field. Therefore, what can happen is uh, that the Higgs oscillation can decay into two photons. And by energy conservation, the frequency of the photons uh, has, have to add up to the frequency of the Higgs mode, right? Therefore, uh, once we excited the Higgs mode, we actually s have s this kind of parametric generator uh, of uh, photons uh, in such a way that their frequencies add up uh, to the Higgs frequency. 
And now, of, like you can say, oh, then all pairs of photons are generated, but then we send in a probe pulse, right? We send in many photons at a very specific frequency, omega 1, and then by the usual argument of uh, Bose enhancement, the pairs uh, which are generated will be the ones which match one of the incoming uh, photons. Therefore, we can think about it as uh, we have n photons uh, of frequency omega 1 coming in, but now uh, we sort of get additional pairs, so we have n plus 1 photon at the same frequency omega 1 reflected, and we generate a complementary photon, like in the language of quantum optics, this is called an idler photon. Right. Uh, and that's the mechanism uh, of light enhancement. So the energy is really extracted from the Higgs oscillation, from the oscillations of the order parameter. And you can actually uh, uh, solve these Maxwell equations with some uh, approximations. Uh, and uh, now you can, uh, you can also uh, say, oh, well, but this was an idealized picture. We didn't put any dissipation. Let's put some dissipation. It turns out that this effect is pretty robust. So what this first plot shows actually, so this is uh, the reflection coefficient at the same frequency as we send in, right? So that just, we send in light at omega one and we're calculating reflected light at the same frequency. You see that it's enhanced, uh, 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 can be enhanced uh, quite strongly, uh, but of course this gets somewhat suppressed uh, if we increase uh, dissipation. But then there is also another part uh, of the spectrum because we're generating idler photons, right? Uh, and that actually is a very pronounced effect as well. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll not talk about this. There are some very, like there is, uh, well, I have to, so maybe it's just uh, for quite some time I would, didn't deal with Maxwell equation. It's actually a lot of fun uh, in this case, like solving Flaque version of uh, Maxwell equations. So you see very interesting uh, generalizations of your conventional geometrical optics, like you remember your total internal reflection. So there are kind of exotic Flaque versions uh, of this. Anyway, uh, so uh, just to uh, come back to uh, experiments, uh, we, uh, So we can ask, okay, does we uh, do these results qualitatively agree uh, with experiments? Unfortunately, experiments were not done in, su in such a detailed way that we can do like very accurate comparisons. So in particular, you know, we have this frequency resolved uh, response, like we're saying, oh, you send light at this frequency, that's how much you should be reflected at the same frequency, that's what you should see as the idler frequency. The way experiment is done, it's, uh, it's a broad band pulse. It's basically like a certain pulse in time. And then uh, you can decompose in terms of frequencies, right? And it will have all kinds of amplitudes. And unfortunately, as of now, that's the only way they can do an experiment. And so they send a pulse in, right, which has many frequencies all at once, and then they get something out, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, which also has many frequencies. They cannot really, uh, 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 kind of very, uh, kind of the spectral composition uh, of uh, the pulse uh, separately. And that's why like what is being reflected then is because they're sending different frequencies, right? Like what you measure at one frequency is a combination of what you send in at the same frequency, or it can be an idler of what you sent at a different frequency, right? So what uh, we can only do is to compare to experiments is just add up kind of, uh, with, uh, uh, kind of the light reflected at the same frequency and idler contribution uh, while taking the, uh, you know, the kind of the spectrum that they had in their pulse, at least qualitatively it seems uh, to match. But hopefully we will see much better comparisons uh, in the future. Okay, so uh, just to finish uh, this discussion, actually, it's actually kind of cool that I think it's a very generic idea uh, that this type of Higgs type lasers, if you so we talked about superconductors, but if you think about charge density wave materials, they have this uh, kind of uh, frequency window, which, you can, uh, which is uh, above the pinning frequency. Okay, maybe for those who haven't uh, thought about charge density wave, charge density wave if you, is, corresponds to having a modulation of electron density due to electrons interacting with phonons. But usually it's very susceptible to disorders. So in most cases, you get a charge density wave, which is pin. But there is a certain finite pinning frequency, which is smaller than the quasi-particle gap. So for frequencies below the pinning frequency, it's like an insulate. You cannot get any current through the system. But for frequencies above the pinning frequency, it's as if there is no disorder at all, 
So actually equations that control uh, the motion of a current are act the, same as equa as the same as London equation for superconductors. Electric uh, uh, current is accelerated by the electric field. And that's why sort of electrodynamics should look very similar in this range of frequencies, above the pinning frequency and below the quasi-particle gap. And people have seen this Higgs-like excitation and charge density wave. In fact, even more robust than in superconductors. So I think that there is a potential to see this uh, in a whole, in, in other types of materials. And then, uh, okay, actually there are interesting potential applications of this Higgs laser, including, you know, making amplifiers uh, converted. So terahertz is actually very challenging uh, range of frequencies. So it kind of to be uh, interesting to explore the possibility of using this many body states uh, uh, for uh, getting actual uh, devices.